store, like I was talking about, or to our, to us. It's not, see, here's the thing, we, we discuss this all the time. We have partners who have mm -hmm. We have plenty of chance to have a business. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, I know, we appreciate it. You guys are pink shoes, right? Yeah. Perfect, yeah. No, I was, I, I had to cut out a little bit last night because I had other things going on, but it seems like really good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pumped. I, I, I think we're going to have a good time. I think so too. Learn a lot, have a good time, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you're from Portland, right? Yeah. And you mentioned that, uh, that you, you were involved in my door sports? Back in the day, yeah. What did you do? Yeah. So, we sold <laughs> more goods. I actually am the loudest human being on the so planet. So you just use your voice. I ask everybody to look forward and talk. Between the mic and the mic. Uh, I can't do it. I can't do that. Can't do that. I can't do it. Yeah, we see. So from a perspective of, of audio um, on this, can, can you guys in the back, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a fairly loud voice, and so rather than walking around with a microphone, I just thought I would just use my own. We need, we need the mic. Well, we need the mic, huh? I, I've been vetoed. Can you guys hear me now? Just a hello, hello? Okay, okay. Well, welcome today, and, um, and thanks for joining us. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today is something that's just very near and dear to my heart, and that's, um, that's marketing. And as uh, a guy who's been an entrepreneur basically all my life, um, being able to effectively reach a market in a cost-effective way is something that I've forever kind of wrestled with and something that um, over the years I think I've gotten more and more effective at it. And so I thought that today what we could do is we could talk about ways to cost effectively reach your customers, and we've broken it down into a few segments. We've got uh, plenty of slides here, a lot to go over in the next hour, so let's get going. Um, before we get started, a couple questions, just a show of hands, is, is how many of you work in firms of one to four people? Okay, and how many five and above? Okay, that's helpful. How many of you have marketing departments within your firm. Very helpful, thanks, thanks, I appreciate it. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is what is fast, fast marketing? That was kind of the, the name of the, uh, the presentation that was given to me, but really what we're talking about is, is how to make marketing quick and productive. Um, based on the fact that not a lot of people in here have their own dedicated marketing team, what we can't do is spend all day marketing and no day, no part of our day actually doing the work. And so um, the next thing is figuring out what you do best and outsourcing everything else. And we'll be spending a fair amount of time on that. Um, leveraging tools to keep in, in front of your clients. And then the last thing is keeping the expenses down and, and the ROI up. Um, we're gonna be talking a bit about marketing and branding. Um, and, and a lot of today will deal with your message, you know, how to figure out what it is, why your message needs to be what it is, how to deliver it effectively. Um, and then we're gonna talk about 
setting up what's commonly called in marketing a, a drip marketing campaign, as well as is once you get a, a fish on, if you will, how do you convert that, if you will, that opportunity into a, a paying client? Uh, when I ask the questions, here's some assumptions that I made, and I, I know what happens when we make assumptions, but um, I'm assuming that the majority of people today has one to four people on staff, that your marketing budget is limited at best, um, that you're already as busy as you can be, and just throwing marketing on top of what you're already doing is, is tough. It's difficult, and you're gonna have to make extra time for it. Um, don't know about this, but for many folks in our community is frankly sales and marketing is one of their least favorite things to do. Um, and in many cases, you'd rather just snap your fingers and have more clients than going through this whole sales and marketing deal. Why do we market? Obviously, we want to make more money. Um, and one of the things that I've seen over the years from a sales and from a marketing perspective is many companies don't truly understand the ROI in their sales and marketing and they end up spending more money on sales and marketing and, and, and actually losing money on sales and marketing. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is, is kind of your brand and, and you know, a lot of people view your brand as, as your logo. Well, here's our brand right here. But your brand really isn't your logo. Your brand is how you live in the minds of your clients and prospects. And one of the reasons we're bringing that up is to be effective with your marketing. One thing you have to be sure is that your brand and your message are consistent and they're united. If, you, um, if you're going out there with marketing and collateral that doesn't support the way that, that you live in, in your clients and prospects mind, then you're not going to have an effective marketing campaign. Um, and, and many of you are, are well aware of this, but I just wanted to kind of level set on what makes for a uh, for an effective marketing campaign in terms of dollars. What we've got here is that you have a marketing campaign and it's twenty seven thousand dollars, and and the lifetime value of the acquisition, in other words, those clients that you bring in from that are worth fifty four thousand dollars. So it's sometimes people look at that and say, well, look, we made twenty seven grand on that campaign. We can do that all day long. Um, that's not necessarily the case, and I think many of us know that, is if that marketing campaign was actually 27 grand and sales from that campaign, or the, what we'll call the lifetime acquisition value of that customer is 54,000, you've got your, your cost of goods sold and your what's called SGNA or sales general and administrative, and if that represents 75% of the money that's brought in, then really your actual net income from that is 13,500, and if you spent $27,000 on it, you actually lost money on that. And just to kind of drill down for many of you probably know it, but COGS and SGNA, think of it as this, is your SGNA is all of your cost without any customers at all. Your COGS are the additional cost typically, this is an oversimplification, but your, your costs that are incurred because you have clients and because you're working with those clients. So here's a simple ROI of a winning campaign. Let's just say that the, the cost of your marketing campaign was $27,000. Um, the actual sales from the, from the marketing campaign, and again, you have to take a look at this from not just the immediate sales, but what will happen is you get further and further along, you're looking at the, the lifetime value of that client. For many of you who are MSPs, what you're looking at is, okay, we signed a, a two or three year contract. How much is that worth to us as a company? And then what you can do is you can actually take a look and say, okay, if the, um, if the net income, if you will, is 25%, then actually this is, this is actually an effective campaign. In this case, we've netted $68,000 on a $27,000 investment. Um, that's taking into account the, the different variables that we actually need to be looking at. Now that we kind of talked about the economics of it, let's, let's kind of jump into um, what we're gonna be talking about today in terms of actual marketing. Uh, and by the way, if you know, as far as taking notes or whatever is, is I'm more than happy to send you this, um, this slide deck. And so when I'm done, if, if you need it, just, just come on up and ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll just 
get a stack of, um, of cards and I'll email everybody the, the deck. Um, understand your target market, as we just talked about. Understand your ROI. Um, figure out your core message. Um, you know, determine the cost effective avenues of reaching them and we'll talk about those different tools that you can use. Um, create a plan to not only cross sell and upsell your existing clients, which is often a great avenue for business, um, but also to convert new clients. And then um, how to hire people to help you execute your plan. And um, hiring people, you may say, Tom, we don't have money to hire people for marketing, but today what we're gonna talk about is some alternative methods that um, frankly I've been using for probably five or six years now that make bringing in the appropriate individuals that are skilled in the right discipline for you is incredibly cost effective. Oops. Um, we don't have money to hire people. And I say, shh, yes you do. Enter the world of a distributed workforce. Um, some of you may have used what's called a distributed workforce. We use uh, a company called Odesk a lot. Um, there's a company called Elance. Some of you have probably used different, different basically websites or portals that have got these. Um, and what I would say is it's not the nirvana, um, but if handled correctly, it's an incredibly cost effective way to engage people who have exactly the skills that you need and to be able to turn on and off that spigot as needed. Um, working with a distributed workforce, here's just a couple thoughts and ideas that I've seen over kind of years of working with them is upfront you need to clearly articulate your needs. They need to know exactly what it is they're working on and kind of when it's done. Um, what I would say is start with, with a mini project. Start with a two to five hour project and see how they do. If they do great, continue. If they don't, again, you can quickly and easily turn that off. Um, lay out the tasks clearly. Uh, what I find is that most of the time, the distributed workforce is able to get things back to you quicker than you would actually anticipate, or in many cases, quicker than you can get it done internally. Um, communicate honestly and respectfully. Uh, and, and not only the good, but the bad. And, and not in a, in a negative way, but what I find is a lot of the clients or the, the, the suppliers we work with on Odesk, you know, what we try to do is we try to take not a, a quick hitter approach, but actually a longer term approach. And many of them have been working with us for two or three years. But also what happens is, is they end up getting busy. And as they end up getting busy, sometimes their work can go down. And just to communicate, hey, you know what, this is not as good as it used to be. And, and what we need to do is refocus and, you know, or possibly if you're too busy, I understand that. Um, and if that's the case, we, we, we might need to be moving on. Um, and then the last one is, is kind of humorous, but kind of not, is don't tell all your friends when you find a good one, because it's, it's not the easiest thing to do to find really, really top talent. And when you find some, and, and we have, um, keep that as your own, is, is, is your own secret little treasure. What kind of services? Yeah. What kind of services have you purchased? We're gonna go into that right now. Um, so thanks for the question is this is just an example we probably use 18 to 20 different people uh, around the world for different things we have um, and we find hot spots for different people uh, for, di for different skills as, as an exa example on um, uh, I work very closely with a, a gal out of the Philippines who is a um, she's a wonderful researcher she helps us with social media um, she helps keep track of stuff and track down stuff for us. Um, just to give you an idea, and, and they work in a different market with different cost of living, but the cost for her is, is $4.44 an hour. And she works for us probably 20 hours a week, and so what that equates to is about $88 a week, and, and she's amazing. She's uh, a college grad, she's sharp as a whip, and as responsive as they can get. Uh, we, we work with a woman out of Atlanta who does our CSS and our HTML, and uh, we've been working for, with her for several years. 
Uh, Benjamin out of Minneapolis handles on our website our back end, so that would be DNS pointers, it would be spinning up websites, it would be backing up things, it would be security, things like that. Um, we work with a gentleman called, his name is Joseph out of Austin. He's a writer that's become more and more involved in the writing and the editorial for SME Nation and what we're doing. Um, we work with uh, Tom out of Milwaukee. Tom is the one who handles all of our graphics, and that's website graphics as well as print graphics, as well as the creation of collateral material. Um, we work with Peter out of Indianapolis, and, and Peter is uh, a guy that um, he, he can put together um, spreadsheets. A lot of times I'm a numbers guy, and so like with spreadsheets, a lot of times what I like to do is put together a spreadsheet that is driven off an assumptions page, and then everything else is tied in, whether it be the P&L or figuring out from a resource perspective and a labor perspective, how many people you need to hire, how many full-time equivalents. And these are whatever, these are six people out of the, the 20 plus people that we work with all the time. And, and in many cases, the, the cost for these people are you know, 50 or 100 or $150 a week. And, and if they get really involved, sometimes it'll go up to $300 a week. But um, you know, I, I think with all the people that we use on a weekly basis, and, and boy, we get a lot done with them, is um, I want to say that it's probably $1,500 a week or about six grand a month. So annualize that at 72 grand. And we've got 18 people that are working with different special things, um, skills that they do on, on a weekly basis and they're, they're available on demand. In other words, you can turn off that sprocket. And, and I guess the reason why I'm spending as much time on this as I am is because a lot of people are unaware that those resources are out there. And, and quite interestingly is that I think Forbes or Fortune just came out with um, a, a projection that by the year 2020, that 50% of the workforce was gonna be a distributed workforce, 50% plus. And so, um, it, you know, for, for us that are always being pushed to get more done with less money, and we always feel as though we don't have enough resources, when it comes to marketing, and I do understand that sometimes marketing is just that little thing above and beyond everything else we do on a weekly basis, and so it's like, you know what, we're not gonna do this because I don't have time. Um, this is a way that you can extend yourself without spending a lot of money. And um, it, it looks like you've used, um, have you used Odesk, Relance, or? Okay, and has it been productive for you? Yeah. You, you know what will happen? I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Is um, Last year with SMB Nation, we did a thing called the SMB 150. Many of you probably saw that. And basically what we did is we had 150 people, we had about 500 nominees, and we, had, um, and we were looking for 150 of the most um, influential thought leaders in, in our community. And we were working with a couple of other groups, and, and one of the other groups was tasked with making sure to get the, the picture and the profile up with um, for, for each of the nominees so people could go in and vote on them. And what we ended up doing is we realized that it was it was more resources than that group had. And so I said, no, it's okay, don't worry about it. Um, I said, let me see if I can get somebody who's an administrative assistant or that can come in and help with us. So what we did is we posted on Odesk. We said, we've got an immediate need for somebody that can do data entry. That was at 10.30 in the morning. By 12.30, we had over 100 people that were ready to do that job immediately, and the average price was between three and five dollars per hour. We ended up engaging two people, and within two days, it was all done. And it's just like, think about that. I mean, we do things like we go to, um, to trade shows, and what we'll do is we'll come back with cards, and we'll just lay them down on a table and take a picture of them, and, and basically send that email to a person that does data entry, and, and they're very accurate. They can go into our sales force, that's what we use, and, and do it. So again, I'm spending as much time on this because I think it's valuable, and, and you know, there's, there's a few things that you'll realize is when you, when you do, do, do a job posting, is that there's gonna be a lot of people that respond, and you need to be very careful about who you pick and for what reasons, and, and you know, yes, you.
So the question is, are we paying Odesk or, or the individual? And what we do is we pay through the Odesk platform and what happens is the money goes to the individual. There's no need for a, a W-9 or anything else. And basically what, what happens is that Odesk keeps 10%. So, I mean, rough numbers is, is if you're paying $20 an hour, they get 18 and Odesk gets two. Not at all, in, in no case. Are you guys successfully using people in India or a certain parts of the world you stay away from? You know what, not really. Um, it's, it's really interesting is, is India tends to be um, very logical and, and database driven and, and when it comes to, to back end and, and programming, they're extremely well. One of the things we found is that on the creativity side, maybe not so much. What's interesting is, as an example, out of South America, we get some great creativity. We get we get people from Brazil, from Argentina, that that end up doing logos and and graphical work for us. They're amazing. Um, out of India, or excuse me, not India. Out of the Philippines, what we do is we end up getting people that understand and speak English very fluently, but work in a different environment with a different cost of living, so they're able to do things much less expensive. And so there's there's different things, you know, one of the things like, it is, as an example, if you're um, looking from a marketing perspective, for someone that can write good sales copy, which we've, we've got one, and I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but um, is you, you, you kind of want to go with somebody in North America, not because we don't like people in South America or, or India, because we have ways of communicating, and and even though people in India are using the, the, the same English, it, it, maybe they're not as familiar with our slang or how we approach things and those kind of things. So bottom line is we've ended up, it's a great question, we end up finding that different geographic regions work better for us for different reasons. Any other questions before we go on? This is kind of back to your question. Marketing with a distributed workforce. We use our distributed workforce for sales copy, for blog writing, for social media marketing. Um, Melody, who I mentioned was the, the woman that works for us in the Philippines, she's helped us to grow LinkedIn groups, to grow our Twitter following, to uh, uh, she comments on direct messages we get back unless she feels that they need to be answered specifically by us. And then in that case, she lobs them over to us, but she's just, every day, just like clockwork, she's there answering those things. Um, we use uh, distributed workforce for helping us with what I'll call pay-per-click marketing. So um, whether it's, it's marketing, you know, they understand how LinkedIn marketing works, how Facebook marketing works, how Google AdWords work, and we use them fairly extensively. We use them for the creation of collateral material, logos, postcards, brochures, white papers. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, we use them to, uh, to help us research what we need to put into um, our collateral material, which by the way, the, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna take a couple quick slides to go over Google Trends. For those that use it, it's just an amazing tool, and for those that, you, that don't, um, it'll be a great couple slides that'll help you understand. Yes, sir? Well, interrupt, interrupt. What else do you call marketing this year? Do you use distributed <coughs> We really don't, and, and I'll tell you why, it's because what we sell and what we're communicating is is so specific that we want to use our own internal people for that because they can they can communicate exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it, probably better than somebody brought in, but I, I know plenty of people that are using um, the distributed workforce for that. Um, so now after we've talked about the kind of your message, your ROI, how to keep your cost for your marketing. There's this guerrilla marketing stuff. This is real people using real methods that actually work. Task number one is understanding your prospects. You know, and this may seem like, duh, I for the obvious, but you really want to think about this stuff is, you know, who are you trying to reach? What's your target market? Um, my experience is people, and this is a, a total overgeneralization, but people make decisions because of almost two different things, and that's fear and greed. And, and so you want to feel, where is their fear? When they wake up in the morning, where do they feel pain? Or when they see something, how are they looking at it? Where it can, and greed can be making money or, or a, a better standard of living, anything like that. I don't say those as bad things, 
but I, I say those as drivers um, in, in putting together your messaging. Then the next thing is, how can you help them? And finally, and I ask myself this question every time I do a marketing campaign is, why should they care? In other words, you know, just think of it this way, is that every time you go out with a message that's a marketing message, your client looks at you and says, so what, right? So what? And what you need to be able to do is you need to have a compelling enough message that talks to the things that, that, that they need an answer to, and you need to be able to answer that, so what? Um, task two is creating the message. What goes into the message? How is that message delivered? And, and very, yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. And what is the call to action? I mean, a lot of people do a lot of marketing without a lot of call to action. Really, what we're looking for in this room is lead gen. We're not looking for top of mind awareness. Forget top of mind awareness, right? Is we need leads. We need leads that we can convert to opportunities, that we can convert into a closed one or a closed loss. What I always say is when it comes to sales is, is that I, I absolutely want to close a sale. But the next best thing is a quick no, because there's a lot of people who will yes you right out the back door, and, and that's not what you need. Um, so the next thing is, th th this, is a, th this is not me and something I came up with. I'll, I'll give you on the next slide, I'll give you where you can go to get this, but this is a book, and basically what they've done is they've taken a look at why people make decisions. And there are other reasons that they make decisions, but this is by far the most powerful and the most important. And you know, these are things when I say built in demand is when you're born, you almost have these desires inside of you. And so um, this is something that you don't have to create a desire. This is something that that desire already exists within you. Um, you know, survival and enjoyment of life, life extension, you know, enjoyment of food and beverages, you know, freedom from fear and pain. Number four is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, comfortable living conditions, to be superior, winning, keeping up with the Joneses, um, care and protection of loved ones, and social approval. Those are all things that if you can tie into your story or your message are extremely compelling. This is kind of a corny name for a book, but go to Amazon, look at the reviews on this, and what you'll say, and again, don't worry about taking notes because I'll send you this slide deck, but this is an incredible book that helps you to understand what's important in your message, how to deliver that message. By the way, anyone in here ever read this book? Cool. Um, it's, it's whatever, it's 10 bucks. I, I would encourage everybody in this room to buy it and look at it and figure out how that ties into what you're doing. The next thing we're gonna talk about in your message is differentiation, is obviously we wanna have kind of a unique selling proposition or whatever you wanna call that, but you're, um, you're, here kind of, um, there's a book that I read years ago called Differentiate or Die, and it had about 20 or so different things that, that really help you to differentiate yourself as a company. But when I really distilled it down, and after years of working with companies, that really what makes sense, is I actually have a whole workshop I do with companies that walks them through creating their brand and their brand promise and everything else, but really being the first, being the leader, the fastest growing, some unique attribute that you can figure out that is just different than everybody else. Um, heritage, something about your background. It was founded by your father that just came over from Italy that, that brought the Italian recipe. Whatever it is that you can build into a story, right? Being the latest and being the hottest. And these are things that you want to think about as you're putting together your message because this is what captures people's interest. Task three, the delivery. Now what we've done is we've said, okay, we've, we've taken a look at what we need to be communicating. We've taken a look at how we communicate that message. Then the next one is, is, is what tools are we gonna use for the delivery? And you know, I, I'm guessing that, that you know, a $10,000 ad in a magazine is probably not gonna work for you, right? I'm, I'm guessing that again, what you're looking for is, is lead generation, lead gen, and not top of mind awareness. You don't care about top of mind awareness. Just because they know about you, it isn't helping you. And so what we, we're looking for here is to find the cost-effective ways to deliver your message, 
Um, uh, number two, bullet number two is really important. Make sure that you continue to deliver that message. It's really easy, guys, to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just swamped this week. We're not going to do it. And that's why if we rewind the movie and go back to the distributed workforce, if you have a plan in place and you have people that are responsible for delivering that, it certainly makes it easier to do. Make sure your message is consistent with your brand. And, and this is really important as well, is pay the extra money to make sure that what you're delivering is, is Fortune 50, I like to call it, that looks as, as professional as Apple Computer or General Electric or, or Microsoft. And, and we, that's really not that difficult to do when it comes to utilizing that distributed workforce. And, and if you don't do it, you have you know, things that look like clip art and, and aren't well formatted. I mean, it, this is an example, we'll go into this in a minute, but, you know, it, it's really important to us that even our, our email templates are very professionally designed and that they're vetted to make sure that they show up on all the browsers the right way. And, and we take the extra steps to make sure that happens. Now we'll go directly into the delivery. Um, how are we doing on time? 11.53, I think we're going to 12.20, is that right? No. I'm gonna have to speed things up with here a little bit. We, we got a lot of stuff to go over here. Um, your website, be certain it is a uh, SEO optimized copy. And if, for, for those that maybe don't know what that is, that's search engine optimized. And basically there's some tools, and I'll give you one. This one. It's 100 bucks, and it's a tremendous tool that can help you identify where the sweet spots are with, with search engine optimized. And where I'm going, well, I'll go into that in a second. Um, the market samurai is the tool I'm talking about here, and uh, I think it's regular at 150 bucks. But if you sign up for their trial version, and and then you know actually buy it within I think a week or something like that, it's 97 dollars, and it's not a month or anything. It's just that's how much it is. And what it does that's amazing is it goes through and analyzes your keywords, and then tells you who your competition is for those keywords and whether it's something that you can realistically go after or whether the big boys are just spending way too much money in this and, and you need to find other keywords that get you that same inflection point. It also goes in and analyzes your competition and, and tells you what keywords your competition is using so that you can understand, you know, you can kind of do a comparative analysis or a competitive analysis. Um, the next thing on your website is make sure it's got a call to action. Um, you know, guys, so many people have a website that's just wonderful, pretty pictures and great copy, and it's like, well, how do I sign up for this? Wow, you know, what's the value problem? What are they trying to sell me? I can't tell. So make sure on your websites that you have a call to action. Um, I'm big about, when it comes to sales and marketing, about giving, not asking. In other words, I start the relationship by giving. Giving a white paper that truly, truly helps them out. And one of the things that, again, there's, there, uh, one of the companies here was Infusionsoft uh, that you may have seen on the floor. And they actually have a, a wonderful tool for campaign marketing and, and CRM. Internally, we use Salesforce, and Salesforce has a thing called Web to Lead, which is drop dead simple to use. Basically, you, just, you pick what fields you want to show up, and you can add extra fields that you can nest or make invisible so you know where the campaign's coming from. And then basically what happens is when they fill it out and click, it automatically shows up inside of your sales force and you can set up workflow to at, make it go to somebody automatically and have them follow up. And as an example, if it's not followed up on in 48 hours, it sends me an email that says, hey, that lead that we worked so hard to get, nobody's followed up on it yet. So there's some things like that you can do to, to make it very valuable. And then my thing here is follow up on leads within 24 hours, but probably not 20 minutes. And, and you, what you don't want to do is have people think that it's like Big Brother, that you're watching them, right? And so you want to follow up quickly, but, but there's such a thing as, as too quick, too. Email marketing, a great way to predictably get your message out, very cost, low cost of delivery. The one thing that I would offer is be careful and don't, don't spam people. I mean, there's, um, <laughs> I remember years ago that you, you used to be able to, to buy basically the telephone directory of email addresses, and people would do that and just send out these messages. Times have changed, guys, and, and people get enough emails in their email box that what you want to do is, you know, realistically, is most of us in this room, we don't need 10,000 new clients, we need 20 new clients. And so, you know, be selective, make sure that you understand who your clients are, who your prospects are, 
and, and use that email list um, it, accordingly. Um, email marketing suggestions. Pay the money to have a really nice looking email plan, template. Don't over email your list. That's what we call in the business, we call it email fatigue. Is if, if all the, we're, we're all aware of that, right? If, if, we, if we sign up for something and all of a sudden every single day there's a, an email from those guys, we're click to unsubscribe because it's like, we don't, we don't want that. We have enough emails. So, you know, what I'm saying is if you have a good message that you're sending out that's truly valuable, send it to them twice a month, not, not every other day, not every day. Um, next thing, this is really important, is consider segmenting your list so you have a high relevance. In other words, if, if your client is a break fix or uh, if, if basically is one of your MSP clients, managed services, or if you're doing cloud, cloud integration, separate those. Take the time to actually separate those and make sure that the messages that you're sending out are highly relevant to those that are receiving them. And again, try thinking of it this way. Always try to give rather than ask. And if you do that, and you continually do that, what ends up happening is they don't have a need right away, but you know what? When they do have a need, they go, you know what? Joe is always sending me information it's so relevant. It's exactly what we probably need. Let's go ahead and give him a call. And that's that's where your marketing your pays off. The more specific you can be, the better the response. Relevance is a big thing. Um, again, what I'm trying to do is make this not just a, a you know kind of a, a high level where we just talk about things, but give you real life examples. Um, here are three email marketing engines, and there's there's more. There's plenty more. Um, ourselves, we use we use Mailchimp just because it's a. Um, do you use that as well? Um, it's it's easy to use. That they, they do a great job. They have wonderful templates that they vet out to make sure that they show up with all the different browsers. Um, and there's a pretty good community of people out there, especially with you know Odesk or Elance, that know how to tweak those templates to make them custom for you. And you know, guys, uh, quite honestly, people can go in and we probably pay almost the most for any distributed workforce person for our email templates to be tweaked. And I think it's about $30 an hour that we pay for that. And and to, to tweak a template, it might be an hour and a half or two hours. And so, like, is, is it worth 60 bucks to, to make sure that, that your message goes out and it, it looks as good as any Fortune 500 company? Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, Social media, you know, there's a lot of hype around social media. We use it. I'm not sure how effective it is for us. We probably, um, well, we, we get some good results from it. Um, a lot of you, you in the audience today are, are uh, your business is more local. And, and in that case, social media can still be valuable, but always, not always. And I just don't want to overhype it. Um, it actually has the ability to create decent leads. Um, again, consider using your distributed workforce for the day-to-day -day activities and bring, you a, um, bring it to you when a lead becomes an opportunity. And, and, and what I think is how I do leads, opportunities, and clients, right? Clients are easy. A lead is someone that you think might be interested. An opportunity is somebody that you've actually talked to, given a value demonstration, and they are interested. They, they are a potential buyer. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure to get as many leads into the funnel as possible. And what you probably don't want to do is take up too much of your time working on, on excuse me, get as many opportunities that you deal with directly, uh, directly and have folks that you're working with help you with the leads. Now, the last bullet point is in our experience, LinkedIn is probably more effective than Facebook from a business perspective. And just as an example, if you're you know, getting involved in groups on LinkedIn, uh, they've got a wonderful pay-per-click where you can target specific groups. In other words, if, if you're in Philadelphia, you can target the Philadelphia Small Business Group and only have your, your ads show up in, in that group, which is, is pretty targeted and pretty valuable. Um, blogs show thought leadership, convey expertise. Um, I, I mentioned top of mind awareness, which you just heard me say wasn't that important. With blogs, if people continually go and see your blogs, or if you convert them into your emails or into articles that you send to um, the local press, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. I mean, everybody in this room that's, uh, that whether you're a break fix person or an MSP or you do cloud integration, you know, I, I think it's truly valuable to get to know the, the people who are editors and writers of the publications in your community 
and, and, and position yourself as a resource. And you know, whether it's the local Journal of Commerce or whatever it may be, is then all of a sudden, you know, every other month they're, they're calling you up and saying, you know, hey Dan, can you, um, can, you, can you write an article on this? Or what are your thoughts on this? Or quote you in it? Those are always really valuable as positioning yourself as a thought leader. Um, direct mail, uh, what I say here is contrary to popular belief, direct mail still has a place in marketing. It's, it's, you don't want to do all direct mail. Direct mail can get to be very expensive. But I think it does have value. One of the things direct mail has been shown to have value with as an example is, is for credibility. Is if, if somebody gets a direct mail piece from you and then they see an email that comes in that is about the same thing, about the same subject, about your same company, all of a sudden it's got more credibility because they've seen it tangibly rather than just digitally. So think about it that way. And then in terms of uh, printing, and, and this is, many of you probably already know this, but I thought, you know, this is another, this is a real life example. Yes, sir. You know, with direct mail, I, for whatever reason, and maybe I'm a creature of habit, I, I've used postcards a lot over the years. And it's been pretty effective, and that, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Is is a postcard? Well, postcards basically come in a couple sizes: uh, four by six or five and a half by eight and a half. And you know, typically, what you want to do is you want the front to be four color and glossy, the black to be black, black and white, no UV coating, which is the glossy. Um, but what I thought was kind of really interesting is, and we've used this company, Print Pelican, for a number of years. They do a great job, and they're very cost effective. Um, but I thought it was interesting here to look at it. So here for 100 postcards, it's, it's 85 bucks. So that's you know, it's 85 cents a postcard. That's, that's pretty darn expensive. But then if you take a look at it and say here at the bottom, and I don't want to get in the way of this, but then I said 500. Well, for 500, the difference is between 85 and 115. And then if you go down here, if you can see at the very bottom, for 5,000, it's $243. So, so, so the, the, the secret there is that once the stuff gets on the press, the, the, additional, the additional printing costs almost nothing. Um, so try to do it in a little bit bigger volume if you can. Yes, sir? A lot of the uh, carriers, like Comcast and AT&T, they use the oversized postcards. Well, those are like a five and a half by nine or 10 inch postcard. So it has a lot more. It's a couple of pennies more. It's not yeah, I mean, here's here's how it works. Is I think when you when you bounce from a four by six to a five and a half by eight and a half, then then basically the, the postage goes up. So you want to watch that. And um, the, the comment, by the way, for the the audio video was that there's there's a lot of people and politicians are doing the same thing. You'll notice that they're sending out the way oversized stuff. Um, quite frankly, I, I haven't done that, but I should I should probably try it as well. They're doing it for a reason, right? And it's probably because they're getting results. But again, if you think about it and say it's a, it's obviously more expensive than your email marketing campaigns, but the thing is, is then whatever else you do to market to them is going to have more credibility because they've seen it tangibly. I yeah. think too when you when you do telemarketing and you call and say, oh, you see that uh, card extension in the mail last week? There's a direct connect there, isn't there? Yeah. Yep. Yes. The uh, U.S. Post Office now has a fabulous service. <coughs> it's very inexpensive. They have a variety of different sizes, including the oversized ones. You send your copy to them in PDF format, and they do all the work, and it's great. The, the, the comment was is the USPS has got a great service for addressing this. And here are a couple things. And by the way, this. Um, Print Pelican here, same kind of deal is you can you can send them your Excel list and and you know here's here's the postcard I want printed and you never even see it because it goes out. If you do that, guys, here, here's what I would suggest is seed your list. Figure out 20 names that you can add into that Excel that are your friends that, that you can call them up and say, hey dude, did you did you get the postcard? Um, just because you want to make sure that the postcard's actually going to who's expected to go to. They're not just collecting your money and then and then not doing anything, right? Um, so, so basically what you see is, you know, I'm talking about direct mail here. You can see you know, how much it costs, and this doesn't include the postage. The postage is typically going to be about 80 or 90 percent, depending on the volume you do. But, but I would suggest that you keep it in your throws. Yes, Adam? It doesn't include postage. No. That's just for the printing. Yep. Yeah. 
you know, we're, we're going to go into that. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not spending too much time. I'm going to have to, it's 12.07, we're out of here at 1220, so I'm going to pick things up. But you're exactly right. And sometimes focusing on fewer people and giving them more attention is actually going to deliver better results. Okay, fish on. <laughs> Let's say you're doing your marketing, and all of a sudden, here it is. You know, we got to fish on. What do you do then? Um, this is just, you know, there's a hundred different ways to look at this, but from a marketing set standpoint and a sales standpoint, I, I look at kind of four different stages. Awareness, educate, build trust, and then convert and retain. What I've got on the slides, and I won't go into it in detail, I'll send you guys the slides if you want, is just different things you can use at each one of those stages to help you with your marketing campaign. You know, it's, it's like they have to know about you first, and, and then they have to understand what you do, which is the education. But, but for everything that we're doing in this room, just because they know who you are and they understand what you do, that doesn't mean they're gonna buy from you. First, they have to trust you because obviously it's with their technology. And, and we all know if we've done implementations that haven't gone perfectly right, is the person that introduces it within the company, they just get browbeaten. And, and so it, it, it needs to be something that they, they actually trust and then the converting and retention is just an ongoing process. Internally, this is this is how we, and we're going a little bit from sales, or from marketing into sales now, and, and I look at, if marketing is the stuff, the message, that kind of stuff, I look at sales as is the, the interaction we actually have with, with our clients, but and even though this is about marketing, I'm going to sales a little bit, but basically what we do internally is, is we have, when I'm tracking our salespeople, it's like, Step one is a value presentation. Um, before you, have, you deliver a value presentation, somebody, it's a lead, right? You, you don't know if they're gonna buy, but if you deliver that value presentation, then typically you can understand whether they're actually an opportunity or not. Um, step two would be deliver a proposal or an offer for services, because that means you know enough about their needs that you're hopefully able to deliver something that is meaningful to them. Step three is when you're in the negotiation process, you're, you're figuring out that what you got them, which is very rarely exactly what they want right out of the gate, you're, you're tweaking that message and going back and forth. And then step four is closed one or closed loss. And, and we look at that on a daily basis. We have pipelines that we look at in Salesforce, and that's how we track basically how much we have coming down the pipe. How to think about sales um, is, don't try to be all things to all people. Um, you know, I would say figure out your niche and do a really, really good job at it. Again, don't focus on 100 people, 1,000 people. Focus on 100 or 200, and then try to start the relationship by giving, not asking. And, and again, giving is, is giving a white paper, giving them an opportunity for a free webinar, or, or giving something that is truly valuable, not just tossing out junk, but truly valuable to them. This is a slide that I, I hope everybody in this room can appreciate. And if, if there's two kinds of sales. I'll, I'll call it the quick hitters and the relationship sales. And if my job was to do a quick hitter sales, I, I would be broke. I would not be able to pay my mortgage or feed my kids. Because basically what a quick hitter sales is, I'm saying that and nothing wrong with it, but I'm just not hardwired for that at all. Um, you know, selling cars or timeshares or vacuum cleaners. Is, in, in those cases, you know, 95 plus percent of the time, you need to close the deal right there when the people are there, or, or they walk away and, and that sale's gone. Um, and also with a quick hitter sales, what I just call it, it's my own word, right? Is that closing the sale typically means the end of the relationship. Um, let me ask you guys this, is how many times have you, <laughs> have you gone back to see the salesman that sold you the car, right? It, we, have, we have a guy back here that does that, right? Oh yeah, yeah that, we um, I, there's a perfect example, but, but then it may be, that's a relationship sale, right? Because, um, you know, when I say relationship sales here, I say, you know, legal firm, accounting firm, and IT firm, you know, it's rare that you close a deal on the first visit, right? It's just, it doesn't happen that often. But also, and the most important thing is, is, is that when you close the deal, it's not the end of the relationship, it's the beginning of the relationship. And, and I think a lot of people in this industry, they say, well, you know what, I, I don't like sales because I'm not a salesy person. Well, 
you know what guys, I'm not, I'm not a salesy person either. Um, and and I, I can close sales just because I really want to, I'm passionate about what I do and, and I want to, I want to educate and let my client or my prospect make the right decision. And if, if we're not the right decision, then, then I want to know that and, and I don't want to sell them. So um, I, I just bring that up because people get a negative connotation with sales and, and, and if they think about that, that kind of quick hitter and everybody in this room, what you're doing is you're not trying to sell a vacuum today. What you're trying to do is open up a relationship moving forward and think about it that way. And, and to, to be effective at it, you, you need to get comfortable with that. Here's a, a, I've given you, this is the second book I've given you and, and buy it. It's, it's called The Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, it's, uh, if you do buy it, pay attention to what um, they're talking about in the book called The Stadium Foot Pitch is Extremely Important. Um, and, and one of the things that they really push hard in this book is, um, again, by selling, by giving something first, and what they're talking about ties very nicely into the cash advertising that I showed, showed you before. So, like, you know, on Amazon, you can probably get both these books for 20 bucks or 22 bucks or something like that, and they're, they're just, they're very valuable. Um, now let's talk a little bit about tools, and I'll, I'll be very brief because we're, we're coming to a close, and I want to make sure that I have at least a minute or two to answer questions. Is again, we use Salesforce. We've got Infusionsoft, Sugar CRM, Basecamp. There's a number of different tools you can use to keep track of these things. I would encourage you to do so, just because otherwise, it, it, things just get lost, and it's easy to do. Um, you know, Salesforce is actually fairly expensive, but I, in, in my mind, anyway, it's worth it. Um, initiating a campaign, some people call these drip marketing campaigns. This is a good way to know you're staying on top of things. Infusionsoft does a good job of this. Salesforce does a pretty good job. It's a little bit harder to set them up. But basically, let's just say that we start by initiating an email. We follow up within three days automatically. This is something you don't have to think about. It just does it. It says, you know, hey, Dan, did you get my email? Um, if, if you haven't heard back from him in the six days, place a call. You know, um, you know. In, in 14 days, an email is, is, is followed up, you know, and in 21 days, a final email is sent, and s sometimes I find that just being honest is is the best thing you can do is, after you've reached out to them four or five times, just, just say in your email, listen, you know, I know you're busy, I haven't heard back from you, is that, um, you know, we're busy ourselves, and, you know, quite frankly, we were really excited about the opportunity to maybe do business with you, but, but you're not going to get a lot more from me, just because I, I don't want to bug you, and I'm busy too. Um, and then, you know, what I typically do with that is, is I'll move that prospect to a, a monthly newsletter just so we stay in touch with them, that we're always giving them stuff again, but not that we've got them in a, in a, a campaign. Um, we're getting close to the end of the deck, examples of goals, and, and, and I understand everybody's busy, so I try to make this kind of light, but, you know, if you had an article that you could get to the local press once a month, that's valuable, and again, you can use your outsource team, your distributed workforce to do that. A, a blog, twice a month, you know, and this doesn't have to be a 1200 word blog. This can be a three or 400 word blog that you just post up on your site. Um, social media posts, if applicable, if you think it's valuable, and you, you'd probably know, is I would say once a week. Um, a direct mail, once a quarter. And then if you go back to our stages, if, you know, this is the way that, that, that just to my way of thinking is if you could say that once a week I want to be in front of a new client giving them a value presentation that is the result of my marketing and then my, my sales. If you could say stage two, I want to get at least two proposals out every single month and then I don't know what you're, how aggressively you're looking to grow your businesses, but one new client a month doesn't sound like a lot, but after a year, that's 12 new clients, and that can really make a difference in, in, your, in your bottom line. Last thing, as I told you, I'd mention this, is Google Trends. And I, just, I mean, Google Trends is powerful. What it does is it aggregates all the data and shows you what's trending. And as an example, the Fed uses Google Trends to help them to determine what their fiscal policy is gonna be moving forward, banks, use Google Trends to help them to figure out how to set their interest rates. And so what I've done here is I just did a couple posts. Here, what I did is, is I, I, did, I looked up value added reseller or MSP, and I, I can't see it, I think it goes back to like 2005, but you can see the level of interest and in where it's gone. 
Um, th that's, I think the, um, this is the, uh, the value added reseller. Here is, uh, oh, here's what it is I said. And, and you've seen Gartner that they've talked about the cloud and cloud computing and, and the overhype and then you know people might be disenfranchised because it didn't deliver all the things that they wanted. And then, and it's kind of like the internet. If you guys remember back in 95 to 98, first the internet was overhyped. Everything was just all bad about the internet. And then it kind of fell off but it was something that wouldn't stop, and then it picked up, and now it's just become ubiquitous or transparent in our lives. But you can see the same thing here. Is you see up until 2008, nobody was really talking about the cloud. Then all of a sudden, you know, people started talking about the cloud. It kind of, that, that hype peaked right around mid-2011, and then basically it, it fell off, and now it appears to be picking back up again. And, and where, I'm, where I'm thinking that like Google Trends is helpful is an example what you can do is you can look on Google Trends and if, you, if you're writing your copy or thinking about your collateral and, and you don't know what word to use, look it up. Find out what word people are actually using and then you can use those words. Uh, kind of summary here is um, number one, make sure your ROI is working in your favor. Don't, don't be compelled to do marketing that you're losing money on. Really make sure you understand that. Um, your message and brand need to be one. Utilize outside resources to get more done. Start the process by giving, not taking. Um, regardless of how busy you get, keep it going, guys. It, it's, it's something that will help your business just to keep this going. Um, treat opportunities as a special gift, and then leverage available tools we talked about a couple of them today. Mailchimp is a wonderful tool. CRMs are a wonderful tool. The Market Samurai is a wonderful tool. Um, educate yourself. Those two books that I mentioned, Cash Retising and The Ultimate Sales Machine, are both good tools that will help you with both small budgets and big impacts. And guys, that's all I've got. It is 12 19, so we're on time and under budget. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hey, no, a great presentation, by the way. First thing I would put on your list is make sure that you can uh, you have the team ready for a lead generator. <coughs> have the salespeople ready to call. I mean, it's, it's obvious perhaps, but no, it's, it's a very good hard. comment. That's that's why stuff falls through the cracks. I mean, but when I say treat your leads as is special gifts, do so. And the comment from the gentleman here was that make sure that you've got people that can actually respond and respond knowledgeably and respond in a, in a timely manner, right? right? That's a great point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. No, you know, you have your choice. You, you can either do uh, a fixed price or hourly. I've not really done fixed price just because I, I just, for whatever reason, I haven't, but that's certainly an option. And what you can do, by the way, is when you go in there, you can look at the last six jobs that they've done and how much they charge, whether it was fixed price or whether it was hourly, you can do all that. Without a doubt, I, I would, everybody in this room, I would encourage you to go look at Elance or Odesk because it's just, it's been valuable, extremely valuable to you. Yes, sir. comment was is whether it's Elance or Odesk, you know, I, I, I don't really put much into what they say about themselves, but I, I, I do the same thing is, is, is I look at what others are, you know, because you can look at, at what people, the last five people that hired them, what they had to say about them and, it, and you know, it, whether they, they flaked out or, or whether they came through all the time, were they responsive, were they, you know, uh, did, did the, the product that they deliver is what they're asking for, and I, it's a very good comment. The, Look at what other people are saying about them, and both Odesk and Elance deliver the same thing with that. Any other questions? Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day.